absolutely blockbuster reporting on Silicon Valley Bank and uh, the deregulation that led up to this collapse. And they're out with a new report. Julia Rock joins us now, one of the journalists on that piece. Great to see you, Julia. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, our pleasure. Let's go ahead and put this latest reporting up on the screen. The headline here is Fed insisted Silicon Valley Bank posed no serious risk to the financial system. Less than two years later, Fed Chair Jerome Powell cited systemic risk as justification to protect Silicon Valley Bank's depositors. And I think it's worth, Julia, let me just read a little bit more of your reporting here, because uh, they cited systemic risk, of course, as a justification to rescue Silicon Valley Bank's depositors. But Jerome Powell approved a bank merger with the same bank just two years ago, saying explicitly that it would, quote, pose, that it would not pose significant risk to the financial system in the event of financial distress. So tell us what you found. So this is a story about a bank merger that the Federal Reserve approved a couple of years ago, as you said. And part of the approval process for that merger involved the Federal Reserve sort of making this finding or declaration that uh, the resulting bank would not pose a risk to the broader financial system, you know, in, in the case that something went wrong. And and obviously, this issue of systemic risk is uh, been the the big issue this week because it was the um, definition that the federal banking regulators used on Sunday to make this extraordinary intervention to bail out Silicon Valley Bank's depositors. So it's pretty remarkable that the Federal Reserve was saying, you know, just in 2021, that a collapse of Silicon Valley Bank would not create a systemic risk when then on Sunday, that was the justification they were using to step in and bail out the depositors. And my understanding from your piece is there was a unanimous vote in favor of this merger, in spite of the fact that you had at least one major shareholder warning against the transaction, you write, arguing that Silicon Valley Bank was vastly overvalued and faced headwinds. Yeah, so this was remarkable. There was a hedge fund that intervened um, and was trying to sort of rally the shareholders against the merger. And they had this PowerPoint where they were arguing that Silicon Valley Bank um, was overvalued by as much as 60 percent, basically arguing, uh, you know, the tech industry was facing headwinds. Obviously, we've seen this in recent months with layoffs, companies going under, things like that, that, that weren't sort of being taken into account by Silicon Valley Bank. So the point being, it's not like there was there's no warning um, that there might be an issue here as, as early as in 2021. Um, but the Fed went and, as you said, unanimously rubber stamped uh, the merger anyways, again, sort of making this declaration that SVB was a bank that didn't pose a systemic risk. And they also said um, was, was being run in a safe and sound manner. You all were also the first to identify that SVB's CEO in particular was pushing for this regulatory rollback that, you know, subjected them to much less stringent requirements and fewer stress tests, et cetera, that might have contributed to this collapse. But you also tracked that there was a move to exempt banks' venture capital investments from the Volcker rule. Can you explain that piece of that? It sounds a little bit wonky, but could actually be critical in terms of what happened here. Yeah, it is critical. So the Volcker rule, uh, as folks might remember, was part of the Dodd-Frank um, era reforms. And basically the point was that federally insured banks should not be undertaking really risky investments because they're sort of backed by the government, uh, subsidized by the government by virtue of having this insurance. So they shouldn't be making bets that, you know, potentially would have really high rewards or but also high risks. And so those are bets, um, investments in private equity and hedge funds. Uh, part of that category is, of course, venture capital. And, and right after the passage of Dodd-Frank, basically, Silicon Valley Bank was out there saying the Volcker rule should not apply to venture capital. Uh, one, because, you know, it didn't involve the casino-like activities uh, that were supposed to be encompassed by the Volcker rule. rule. And second, because they said it would hamper innovation in the tech sector. Mm -hmm. So while Silicon Valley Bank did not initially get uh, an industry-wide exemption for venture capital, the Obama administration uh, kept the Volcker rule covering venture capital. They did get their own special exemption that only a handful of banks got to retain their investments in um, sort of Volcker rule covered funds for an extra five years. 
During that period, uh, the Federal Reserve and other banking regulators came in. This was during the Trump administration, but it was under Chairman Powell, who, of course, was reappointed by Biden. They came in and granted this industry-wide exemption for venture capital so that now the Volcker rule doesn't cover venture capital. And of course, Silicon Valley Bank, um, as as we've been seeing all over Twitter with with these uh, venture capitalists sort of begging for a bailout over the weekend, Silicon Valley Bank had venture capital investments. And we're going to see, you know, hopefully there's supposed to be an an investigation of exactly what happened here, what risks and poor decisions led to this catastrophic outcome. But one thing that already seems clear is they had a really concentrated risk in terms of interest rates, where when the Fed was hiking rates, not only was this hurting their asset side, it was also hurting their depositors, which were overwhelmingly um, VC-backed startups. So you have that concentrated risk. And then if you also layer on top of that, not only are your depositors these venture-backed startups, but you also have investments in the VCs themselves. So that only further consolidates your risk and makes you even more vulnerable to what the Fed policy was. And and what's so remarkable uh, about this, Crystal, and people have, uh, you know, watchdog groups are saying it, lawmakers are now saying it, is like this was all out in the open. You know, short sellers were talking about this in January. There was media coverage. Of course, we were all reading it of, of the risk posed by interest rate hikes. You know, there were rules in place that, as I said, were were rolled back, designed to uh, protect against this precise thing. Watchdog groups were warning about what was happening. So it's not like the Federal Reserve did not have the information uh, to be sort of adequately supervising this bank. Um, And and we'll see what comes out. You know, there's now going to be sort of a review of the Federal Reserve's activity and supervision leading up to, um, you know, the bank collapse. Uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren is saying Chairman Powell should not be part of the review, given that he was doing a lot of this uh, deregulation. But there's a big question about uh, how much they knew, why they were looking the other way, things like that. Yeah, and how thorough their investigation will ultimately be remains to be seen as well. Julia, great reporting on this. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. Hey guys, ready or not, 2024 is fully upon us now. And Sagar and I have been brainstorming ways that we can really up our game for this critical election. Yeah, we rely on our premium subs to expand our coverage, to add staff, to upgrade the studio. We just want to give you the best independent coverage of this election, which is possible. So if you can help us out, become a premium subscriber today, breakingpoints.com, or the link is down here in the description video. It really means the world to us. And if you like what we're all about, this is the best possible way to keep us 100% independent, working only for you.